I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. We can fool ourselves into thinking that we're invincible and that we're not going to follow in the footsteps of everyone around us. You know, a lot of what I say to people is probably not what they want to hear, but it's what they need to hear. 70% of adults are not doing resistance training. That's actually where people need to first focus their attention. It's critical. Is there something I should be asking my doctor in addition to the standard stuff? This is a, an unbelievably good question. Nutrition, exercise, sleep, these key pillars. What is the greatest predictor of longevity and happiness? Above fame, above money, above cholesterol, blood pressure, all of these common risk factors, the best predictor was the quality of your relationships. What can we do to compress the number of years where we're affected by disease so that we're adding life to our years? I think the message needs to be that anything is better than nothing. The body is very resilient and it will still upgrade later in life. What I would say to people is it's not too late to start this. Simon Hill, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Mark, thank you very much for having me. Uh, you're from Byron? Yeah, I'm in between Byron and, and Bondi. Bondi boy, is that your territory? Or? Well, actually, I grew up in Melbourne. Melbourne. So I moved to Bondi about eight or nine years ago. And then during COVID, sort of shifted most of my time up to Byron. You saw the light. Yeah. <laughs> Melbourne to Bondi to Byron. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a trial. That's a, yeah. that's a trial. Yeah. I think that that's probably pretty common. And you, so you, how long have you been living up in the, up in the Shire up there? Been in Byron now for two years. Two years, and uh, and do you have? We'll talk about your business in a second. But do you do you have a you have a business premises up there too, or do you operate out of home? Operating out of home, and yeah. and most of my team is sort of online. Some are based in Byron, and then others are freelancers. The broader question about you know health, mm. which is your territory, but there's, some, there's always been something about Byron Bay. I don't know if you've sort of dug into it at any stage, but there's always been this sort of healing healing concept about Byron Bay. I mean, I, I've got a property up there. I've had a farm up there for 20 odd years. Um, for me, it's where I go to chill. And um, and I don't know whether it's because it's quiet or I don't know whether it's, it's, you know, it's full of surfers or I don't know whether it's because it's full of weed or, or whether it's, you know, a certain type of person or whether it's the magnetism in the ground because it is all part of, a, of an old vulcan volcano system and it's the furthest part out of the sea i just can't get my head around it what do you do you think there is such a thing as places that are healthy for you i do think that uh i think i mean your environment matters a lot the people around you represent the lifestyle that you lead we know that if you are surrounded by people that are overweight for example you're much more likely to be overweight or people that have diabetes you're much more likely to develop diabetes and if you look at the longest living people in the world, they don't have greater willpower than you and I. They just have an environment that's set up for them to succeed, right? And in most developed Western countries, when you look at cities, the, the environment is very much set up for people to fail in terms of the food choices they're going to make on the day to day, the exercise they're not really going to do. I think places like Byron attract a certain person who appreciates the present moment. They're aware that they have a lot of control over their health. So they're, they're very much valuing their lifestyle. And so it's attracting these types of people who are, you know, very aware that the exercise they do or don't do the foods they eat or don't donate the relationships that they cultivate or don't cultivate have a huge impact on their happiness now and on their long longevity as well. To me, and I'm just an observer, but the whole health aura vibe has sort of emerged at a faster, more intense rate out of COVID or, uh, sorry, post-COVID. Uh, it just doesn't observe. It seems like we are much more aware of health, we might not know how to execute on it, but it seems to be more people that I know. Maybe just more people. I know more people my age, perhaps. But no, that's not true. I know. I now. I do know a lot of people, like much younger than me. Um, and it seems to me to be a bit of a conversation, uh, like a rising tide, 
Now, you're, you would describe yourself as a nutritionist. Would that be the best way to describe yeah. you as? Yeah, uh, I started off as a physiotherapist. Right. Sports physiotherapy. And I was working with professional athletes in Melbourne, AFL footballers, and then did a master's in nutrition. So that's really my primary area of focus now. And nutrition, and I'll, I'll come back to the question, but in terms of the rising tide, but in nutrition, is that like a dietitian too or is it different? Yeah. Yeah. So you would, you're a person who prescribes not prescribes, I don't know if that's the right word, but advises somebody how to build their nutrition relative to a diet. Yeah, and relative to their goals. So are yeah, they okay. an athlete? Most of the people that I'm now speaking to and people that are listening to my podcast are people that are interested in feeling good today but also lowering their risk of chronic disease. They want to feel better for longer. So that's really where the, the majority of my focus is is on today. Yeah, in terms of um, patients, is that the word? Is that the right word or clients? Clients. Clients. Yeah. So, so I'm not day-to-day -day seeing clients. Right. You know, I have a podcast and I'm recording a couple episodes a week. And what's your podcast called? It's called The Proof. The Proof. So we have, you know, 300 plus episodes and I spend my time, you know, my background is – trained in science and I think my skill set is speaking directly to scientists who really spend most of their time writing academic papers or speaking at conferences and having conversations with them and and translating that to the everyday person. Simplifying it. Right, so that they can make sense of it and grab a hold of it and use that information to improve their lifestyle. So the in the proof, you curate, curate experts or people who probably don't write articles in the Sydney Morning Herald or the Byron Bay Times or whatever it is, they're probably, probably writing it for um, Nature or something, one of those sort of more scientific publications right. which academics ordinarily would be writing for and uh, you find these people, You, as I said, you cur curate them on the topics relative to health and wellness and then you sort of interpret mm -hmm. what is they're talking about back to the audience. And I got that training as a young kid. My dad's a prof professor of physiology. Right. And, you know, 30 or 40 years as a scientist, there would be studies all around the house and in the car. I'd have to move them if he's picking me up from school and highlighted and scribbled on. And so you can imagine that the discussions over dinner, you know, half the time I couldn't understand what he was saying and I'd have to just, Dad, slow down. What do you mean? And so I, I, I got very used to asking, I guess, the basic simple questions to try and clarify things. And I think that's helped me now where... Yeah, I, I reach out to professors that are experts, for example, in specific types of exercise like zone two training. I just did one the other day. Or professors from Stanford, their whole career is dedicated to clinical interventions for nutrition. Or professors that spend their time studying hunter-gatherer tribes. And professors that are spending their time thinking about psychology and happiness and, and, and all these different topics and sort of areas about health. And my job is to try and take the research that they're doing and make it accessible. So I can't extend my life, you know, because maybe I can a little bit, but like you can't really extend it outside because genetics or you'll ultimately die of one of cancer or a heart attack or some sort of brain disease. But I can ex expand how well I live, how healthy I am during that period. Is it fair to say then that broadly speaking, the three things I've got to be getting my head around is uh, – my nutrition is, in other words, what I'm putting into my body, um, how well I exercise generally, so what's my training program look like, and then finally how I sleep. I think generally speaking, and what you're talking about there, just to, to really clarify it, is compressing the number of years where you're affected by disease. Mm. So even if we're not extending your life, rather than you having one chronic disease or comorbidities too, which – over 50% of adults in Australia over the age of 65, they have two or more chronic diseases. Over 50%. Well, I mean, at the bottom 50% then, that's good. Right. But so how can we, what can we do to compress the number of years where we're affected by disease? Yeah. So that we're, we're adding life to our years, however many years that is that we're, we're going to live. I would agree with you that those are three very important buckets and I know that you want to put relationships to the side. I, I, I'm not saying it's not an important bucket but I – there's there's there right. three I can sort of a better control over because relationships rely on other people. They do, but they probably start with ourselves. <laughs> no, no, totally, totally. And, oh. and I was surprised to learn, you know, and this is in discussions I've had recently with a Harvard 
a director of a study out of Harvard, Robert Waldinger, and we won't dwell on this too too much because I appreciate you want to spend time on those other aspects. But they followed uh, adults from Harvard for 80 years. So it's a longitudinal study. Yeah. But they were looking at what is the greatest predictor of longevity and happiness, okay, because we don't want to just live forever. We want to be happy. You don't want to be a miserable bastard. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, yeah, there's, there's no point in optimizing, you know, all of these aspects of our physiology if we're not enjoying our time here right we have to enjoy the human experience yeah and above fame above money obviously you need a certain amount of money we know that um, above cholesterol blood pressure all of these sort of common risk factors the best predictor was the quality of your relationships not the quantity but the quality and there's been a lot of research that then has dug into that over the years and there is a physiological explanation for that. It seems that the quality of your relationships has a direct influence on stress attenuation, which translates to inflammation in the body. Yeah. And we know that inflammation is a hallmark of many of the leading non-communicable chronic diseases, whether it's heart disease or type 2 diabetes or fatty liver disease or various types of cancer. So I think it's worth just kind of underlining the importance of relationships, even though we're going to carve them to the side. Certainly something in my life that I've placed greater emphasis on in recent years. Well, mate, let's let's look at it for a second then or for for a few moments if you don't mind. Like so when you say relationships, you don't mean necessarily husband and wife. You mean the community within which we live or the village within which we exist. Is, Is that what I'm talking about? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It could be brother, sister, could be friends, could be pe- people that you play tennis with. Is it all those things as well? Can it, should, it be, should it be all those things? Because in other words, let's say I'm living on a desert island and I'm, I'm there with my best friend, male or female. Is that enough or are we talking about, no, no, Mark, you need to be going down to, uh, you know, the, the coffee shop in um, – near the record store in Byron and uh, howl and moan and you sh- you need to be having coffee and seeing the, the team down there and seeing passers by friends who, who you know quite casually. You need to be walking into howl and moan records and talk to Mario in there and say, hey, mate, how you going? Uh, you know, if we've got that record that I ordered, I'd love to get that Janis Joplin album, whatever it is. Is it about the bro- a broader community or is it about just really having at least having one good partner? I think the – the broader community is going to be important, but more so f- for certain individuals. This is going to differ depending on the, on the person. So it's certainly not about the quantity of the relationships. That's right. clear. Yeah. Right? It, it really is about the deepness yep. and the so ability. It's about depth, I get The depth it. and yep. the ability to have people in your life that you can speak to almost about anything and share you know, anything that's coming up for you. And in that, process of being able to share and then listen you can you know lower anxiety lower stress and the downstream benefit of that is greater happiness and health and health right these people are are living longer that have these high quality relationships now often people hear that and think you know, they might be single and think, well, I don't have a romantic partner. But this is not just exclusive to romantic partners. It's not about romance as such. No, no. so yeah. you you can be single and be completely happy, absolutely. Mm. Um, and you'll, you'll have other people in your life that are not a romantic partner that you can – speak to and could be your folks and be vulnerable with and share openly. Could be and, your brother or something like that. Right, and, and also it, it might not just be – about us as individuals being able to share with someone but also us being able to listen and show up for someone else. So it work, It kind of works both ways when we're talking about building quality relationships. You're saying this is in a uh, scientifically shown or indicated as opposed to, you know, like someone making a wish for this, like it's a nice thing to have. Yeah. There is scientific evidence around this as to people's um, – quality of life relative to the longevity as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has been published. This has come out of Harvard, but it's also been replicated. You know, that initial study was with white males. So a a good question would be, you know, is 
is this is the quality of the relationship important for everyone or is this just exclusive to this cohort of white yep. males but this has been replicated males females different cultures um and it makes sense right we 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 all know and have experienced the benefits of having quality relationships in our life and when we don't have them we feel isolated and we're much less able to deal with stress and anxiety well sarah wilson wrote a book many years ago about uh, giving up sugar she went to these what are now called the blue zone places you know um okinawa mm-hmm. somewhere in italy i can't remember the name of the joint um sardinia sardinia is correct um Ikaria in Greece and there's a few other places that we're to. And, and one of the things, and, as, and by the way, Netflix now has a series on it, pretty much replicating what she talked about at the time, although it's not about sugar, it's about you know, longevity, lifespan. Um, and one of the things that's coming out of that series is exactly what you're talking about is having like a little village around you. Like, or you and a lot of these places, by the way, are in villages that don't tend to be in big cities. They tend to be in small villages where you know everyone. Pretty much everyone's related to you. All the people there who live a long time all seem to have a function. You know, my dad comes from a village in Greece and uh, I can see the one in Ikaria, which is very similar to what my dad has described, how his village worked when he was living in Greece. And in fact, it's a little bit even how he lives his life now. My dad's 90, so and he's still in great health. Um, it's a little bit similar to the way he lives his life now. And it was all about community he had and in the career as well they have a community they like a quite a close community a lot of times a lot of times they're cousins or brothers or sisters and or friends have grown up with people who they trust and they know and it might be just a matter of sitting down and having a cup of coffee or and they feel supported by yeah yeah I, they can lean on them yeah. so does, that, does that sort of fly in the face then of um living in a big city if you're living in a city because of the way our cities are set up you have to be very intentional and I mentioned before that, you know, people in Okinawa or in, in this, these um, Greece or in Italy in these centenarian populations, they're not exhibiting greater willpower. It's just that their communities are set up in that way. Yeah. And so they naturally benefit from And they didn't set it up either, by the way. Right. They just grew into it. So if you're in Sydney, I mean, step one is awareness and we're talking about it now. There'll be a lot of people that just are not even aware of this being critically important to their health span they're just on the merry-go-round right but then once you are aware of it you know not everyone can move to byron bay or move to okinawa (laughs) so when you are aware of it you have to realize you're going to need to be very intentional with setting up what part of your environment can you control you control your household to an extent you can control your office and your culture at work how can you modify some of these things to make it easier to build better relationships high quality relationships and so it's not that uh, I live in Sydney therefore I can't have any of this you know I think you can still do things so in terms of nutrition you know I uh, talk about the Mediterranean diet I say yeah but is it about the Mediterranean diet because you know I can repeat the Mediterranean diet here in Sydney but is it really the Mediterranean diet because the tomatoes that you buy in Greece are grown in a certain type of soil that might be full of zinc or potassium or phosphorus or some other thing, I don't know. Whereas the tomatoes I buy here might have been grown in a greenhouse, they might have been grown some part of Australia which is doesn't have that, those components in there. Has there been some sort of analysis of the diet relative to what you are actually getting out of the foods you eat in a Mediterranean diet? There are going to be some subtle differences in terms of the nutrition that are in the foods we're eating depending on where we live across the world we know that for sure but the theme of eating that consistently reduces risk of chronic disease and is associated with longevity is replicated across continents across countries so there's enough information for us to know that it's not something isolated to a specific area in one part of the world because of their soil or their farming techniques right granted there might be some some small differences But I think big picture, when we zoom right out, we see a lot of consistency. And you mentioned the Mediterranean diet. That's a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables. It's high in fiber. It's low in saturated fats, but contains a good amount of polyunsaturated fats. And we could talk about 
fat if you want to double click on that at some stage but there has been periods where fat was totally demonized mm. which was an oversimplification i remember as a kid right. in the 60s and 70s it was totally demonized and that was an oversimplification you know not all fat is created equal and we understand that there are fats sure that you want to go a bit easy on and then there are other fats that are very heart healthy and inherently beneficial so adopting a, a low fat low total fat diet probably isn't the best strategy um, but critically important to all of these different dietary patterns around the world like the mediterranean and other areas where people are thriving is what they're not eating yeah they're not eating 60 percent of their calories from ultra processed foods and what does that mean ultra, ultra processed yeah these are these are foods that have undergone significant processing they usually have added sugars, added fats, they've been stripped of fiber, they're low in water, they're low protein, they're energy dense, they often have artificial flavors, often have a lot of sodium. And together, those characteristics work to make them very easy to overconsume. So they're what we would describe as hyper palatable. Or sort of addictive nearly. Addictive. They're not, they're not filling us up in the same way as whole foods will for a given amount of calories. And there was a beautiful study from Kevin Hall. He's an obesity researcher in, in the States. And he did this study with the NIH over there where he, he brings people into a metabolic ward. And some people say that's like prison. They, they bring them in and they literally can weigh and look at every single thing that these people eat. And for two weeks, the participants were given an ultra processed diet and then for the other two weeks they were given an unprocessed diet and importantly he, he was able to in these meals match things like fiber and sugar and protein and salt which doesn't actually happen in the real world so if anything he was making this study more favorable to ultra processed foods so the only difference was that one set of foods are unprocessed the other set are ultra processed like biscuits or yeah, biscuits it, it, and cakes chips. and some of the frozen foods that you get out of the fridge, but not frozen vegetables, like frozen yeah. pizza or something like that. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, ice creams. Yeah. Chocolate bars. Yeah. Sugar um, sweetened beverages. All yep. these sorts of things. Yeah. Some of the morning cereals. Yes. Yeah. The, the more popular stuff with kids, and people got the opportunity to do each diet for two weeks. And they were told, importantly, eat as many calories as you need to, like eat as much food as you need to, to feel satisfied. When they were eating the ultra processed diet, these people were eating about 500 calories more per day. Well, we're matched. So, I mean, we we've don't have diet. the a big key tummy. things like we've matched protein, we've matched fat, we've matched added sugars, we've matched fiber. But what about people? I mean, in terms of like. These the, were healthy adults. Yeah. So, so we didn't get so someone with um, who's seven foot tall versus the stomach that big <laughs> compared to say someone who might be You're your own control. Right. Okay. So, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not comparing a seven foot person to a small person. Yeah, so we're not we're comparing me to somebody else. We're comparing me to me. Yes. And on the individual level, the average individual ate 500 more calories per day when they were eating these ultra processed foods. Wow. And it's still not fully understood why that is. What is it about these foods? But the leading hypotheses are probably energy density. So a lot of calories per bite and then eating rate. You can eat these foods much quicker. Right. So it might be that because you're able to consume them in a, in a shorter period of time, you don't get the feedback from the brain that you're act to put the brake on. You're actually, you've eaten enough calories. And so you're putting too many calories into the system before you get that feedback. Is there any relationship with ghrelin, for example? Like um, does the ultra processed food somehow um, uh, stimulate the ghrelin in your system, in your stomach to make you feel more hungry? Yeah, it could. That They did look at that and they didn't notice anything, but it's only two weeks. Right. Um, but it, And it could also be that that leptin, which is telling you to slow down, that again, coming back to eating rate because you're eating so quickly. Doesn't have the time to kick in. Doesn't have the time to kick in. Yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah. So there's certainly something going there and, and – the point that I was, I was making was these healthy dietary patterns that you see across the world, all of them consistently, that's a consistent kind of characteristic of the dietary patterns is that they don't have, they're not eating ultra processed foods. 
because a lot of times when we feed ourselves today, it's not about sitting down with our friends or our family to have a meal and have a chat and stop and talk and it's about it's more a function mm. oh it's dinner time we've got to eat shovel it in just get this done because <laughs> yeah. we've got to get back on the computer and do our work or yeah. whatever it is we're going to do so food becomes a like a, a functional thing as opposed to something you enjoy in a community not a community sense but like something you sit down and enjoy and we, of course we you know we have this whole movement about mindfulness but in other words taste what you drink and you know chew your food and taste it does that somehow have a play or a role to play, I should say, in um, this whole environment? I think it does. And, I mean, mindful eating is a big movement. And, I mean, we all know that when you sit down and you're, say, you're working or watching TV and you, you know, you can inhale your food. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Before you know it's it's gone. Yeah. And, and also your digestion is working much better when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Yeah. Right, that rest and relaxation system. That's when our digestion is primed to work. And, and parasympathetic, just for those listening, versus the sympathetic, sympathetic. system. So in other words, parasympath- the parasympathetic system is the relaxed version of us. The sympathetic version is when, you know, we've got cortisol flushing through our system and we're in fight or flight mm-hmm. mode. In other words, we're in a hurry to get this meal over and done with because we've got a Zoom call right. straight after dinner. And that also directly impacts our metabolism. Right. So you know, if we're wanting to, to reduce our calories that we're consuming, often I'll speak to people about mindful eating. Right. So <laughs> that's, that's a big one. When do you eat and what's the, the circumstances yeah. within which you eat? And then the other thing is trying to reduce liquid calories. Because what, what's that mean? Well, su- sugar-sweetened beverages or very high-calorie drinks, you can consume those very quickly. You mean like? you know, the usual stuff like Coca-Cola Fanta or whatever right. you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. And so if you're if you're struggling to lose weight and weight loss is your goal, you want to chew more of your food and drink less of it. Drink less of your calories. Y- yeah, you want to eat so so just so And also I, alcohol falls into that. But. Yeah. Yeah. That all makes sense to me. So but it let's have a look at that's more formatting. What about in terms of what we should be eating? Because but the meat seems to be twice the hero of the plate. Yeah, totally. Firstly, I think, I mean, protein is certainly an important part mm-hmm. of our dietary patterns, but I, I do th- think it's been overemphasized. And a lot of that comes out of the fitness industry, to be, to be fair. And the interesting thing is if you look at, say, strength, which is a key predictor of longevity. Yep. So I'm not necessarily talking about muscle mass here. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to have huge amounts of But of some muscle mass. mass. You want to have some. Yeah. You need to have some. But you need to have and, grip strength, for example. But, but strength is a better yep. uh, predictor. And there's a beautiful analysis. This was done a couple of years ago now looking at how strength increases in two different scenarios. Um, scenario one is when you just dial up protein, but you have no resistance training. Okay? So – just picture a sedentary person yep. who decides to increase their protein intake because they see it everywhere and they think, wow, I need, I need protein to stay strong. And then scenario two is let's dial up protein, but let's do some strength training as well, resistance training. In that first context- Lifting weights, you mean? Lifting weights, yeah. right? Or moving your body against or resistance. Or pull-ups or whatever, yeah. yeah. Right. You, some form of resistance that you're working against. In that first context where there's no resistance training, mind you, which is 70% of the adult population, when you increase protein, you get basically no increase in strength at all. So protein on its own without the actual stimulus to drive the adaptation, stimulus being lifting that weight, that's a stimulus that sends a signal to the body, let's adapt, right? And it will use protein to do that adaptation. But if you don't have that stimulus, it doesn't matter if you just dial up your protein. So within the context of Australia where 70% of adults are not doing resistance training, that's actually where people need to first focus their attention. In that second scenario where people are, where we're looking at increasing protein with some resistance training, you see an increase in strength up to about 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram. So, so you need to intake 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram that's, of your own weight. That's where you get to like the optimal 
strength and then it plateaus out. So like in my, in my case, I'm 80 kilos, so I need to put in um, 120, uh, 120 grams. grams of yeah. protein, which is not, by the way, 120 grams of steak. No. We're going to come back to the source. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of preface the importance of protein and, and where I think people are are kind of focusing on the wrong thing, right? The, for the average adult in Australia, they're getting about 1.2 grams of protein per kilo. Right. So you might say, oh, that's not optimal. Maybe they need to eat a bit more. But if you look at that chart, when resistance training is there, the difference between 1.2 and 1.5 grams in strength is tiny, right? 80% of the improvement in strength can be achieved at the average intake of protein that the adult in this country has. So across the Australian population, if we were to go out and do an intervention that's going to have the greatest return on investment, it's to get people doing resistance training. It's not to get people eating more protein. So can I just, can I, do you mind if I just ask you something though? It's just on the protein piece. Um, if I want to intake, in the example you just gave me, 120 grams of protein, how, and just assume we're just going to eat beef for the moment to make it easy. Uh, how many grams or kilograms of steak do I have to have to get me 120? Like, ha, ha, like if I got a 250 gram piece of fillet steak, mm-hmm. how many grams? What does that compute to in That's terms? Probably of, about 20 to 30 grams of of, of protein. protein. Right. So, so if I got to get six times that, mm-hmm. I got to get uh, eat six 250 gram. Mm-hmm. St- uh, that, that's impossible. Right, and that's probably not going to be the best strategy to do if you're also wanting to consider your long-term health. No. Right, because we're not just talking about strength here. We have to think about our cardiovascular system, our liver and metabolic health. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of different... Going to the toilet. We're, we're trying to optimize multiple things. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Um, but how so, do I do it then? Like, so what am I supposed to do? I mean, how, how do I get close to the 120 grams of protein? Okay, well, you could, you can have... Let's say for it depends on what type of dietary pattern you're consuming, but I'm consuming that you're, um, I'm assuming here that you eat all foods. Yeah, so, yeah everything. Yeah. So in the morning, you could have some high protein Greek yogurt with oatmeal. That'll get you 20 to 30 grams. Right. Um, for lunch, you could have uh, a salmon salad. That's going to get, and maybe on that salad, you've got chickpeas or some other legumes in there. That'll get you another 30 grams. Afternoon, you might throw in a protein shake. I think that that's perfectly fine for people that are optimizing their protein. Remember here, that 120 for you, we're talking about optimal. Right. Yeah, you're, yeah. Still going to, you're still going to increase strength at 1.1, 1.2 grams per kilo, which for you is 90. So if I have a little bit less, it's okay. But let's say I'm, a, I'm an optimal sort of dude yeah. and I'm trying to you know, optimise my position mm-hmm. um, and I want the one half. So what you're saying to me is, Mike, you don't need to do it in steaks <laughs> um, or in the example we just gave right. because that's impossible. But, but And then at dinner you could have some type of plant-based protein like tempeh or tofu. Right. And across that day you'll, you'll end up getting to that 100, 120 grams of protein. So now I've got my 120 grams of protein. Let's say I've got that somehow nailed, like, and that what you said, that's a doable thing. Those yogurt, mm-hmm. oats, etc. during the day, salmon at lunchtime, you know, some, some maybe tofu or tempeh or et cetera in the evening. What about in terms of that's protein, got it, and I'm and let's assume I'm doing a, a reasonable strength training session few times a week. So what are we talking about? Do, do I have to train? Do I have to do resistance training every day or am I doing it three times a week? I mean, I've, I've read some studies, which was one study said, remember um, three, five. So I don't know if this is right or not, but no, hopefully I get this right. Um, you lift a weight. So you, are you trying to um, lift weights for every muscle group. So let's mm-hmm. say today I'm going to, you don't have to do it every day, not every muscle group every day, once a week each muscle group. Let's say I'm going to do chest to make it easy today. So you lift a weight for chest, so bench press for example, um, you lift a weight that you can only do, that's heavy enough that you can only do, do between three and five and give yourself a, quite a good rest between each set and you do three to five sets mm. 
and you do for the chest, you do three to five different exercises. I mean, it might be flies, it might be bench and whatever another one is for that. I don't know what it is, but whatever. Mm. Um, and that can help you optimise your chest strength and you do the same the next day for maybe for legs or then you do back one and blah, blah, blah. Is, 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 that, is that what we're talking about or would we just go and do what we normally do, do 10 of this and mm. I mean, how strategic do you need to be about all this? This is a, an unbelievably good question because what you've just described there is protocols that powerlifters and strength athletes are going to be focusing on. Mm. I'm definitely not prescribing that to the average 40, 50, 60 year old who's looking to optimize their health and longevity. When you're lifting three to five reps and you're, you're taking that set to the point where you will get an adaptation, which means say two reps shy of failure, you want to be a very experienced lifter mm. <laughs> doing that because you're, you're lifting. Or lift with somebody else. Yeah, or lift with someone else. Yep. But, but the risk of injury there is much higher. Yep. And you can get strength and hypertrophy, so the development of, of new muscle adaptations, lifting lower weight but doing more reps. So right. as you said, you know, 10 to 12 reps. I, find, I think anywhere between, weight? anywhere between 8 and 12 reps, I, I would say – suits most people that are looking to optimize health span and longevity. But for do you lift few, 60% of your max or what are you talking about there? If I think the or... easiest thing for people to understand is that they need to be two reps shy of failure right? where okay. you can no longer do that. So if, right. if, you're, if you choose a weight and you go, I'm going to do 10 or 12 reps and you get to the end of that set and you've done 12 and you, had, you feel like you had another 10 reps in the bank, that weight's not heavy enough for you. Right. Now, there's research showing from a hypertrophy point of view, you can go all the way up to 30 reps and people during COVID were, were loving this research because they didn't have weights at home. So they had little light weights. But if you, if you take the light weight and you do enough reps and you still get two, two reps shy of failure, you will still get hypertrophy adaptations. Now, the reason I don't well, love hypertrophy building, building muscle. muscle. Yeah. The reason I don't love that rep range from a health span optimization point of view Outside of someone, if someone has an injury, say a sore shoulder, those low weight, high rep ranges can be really good. Yeah. They can be much easier on the joints. But if we're looking at holistically optimizing your health span and longevity, I also want a stimulus that's going to help you lay down bone and protect your bone mineral density. And for that, that's where this slightly lower rep getting in that six to 12 rep range is going to be a greater stimulus, not just for strength and for building of muscle, but also for maintaining bone mineral density, which is really important, mostly for postmenopausal women. You know, they're the highest risk sort of cohort. Or well, men who take um, PPIs, right. men who take, um, you know, tablets for stomach yeah. gas, uh, acid, I should say, like um, parrot tablets and things like where they stop you from digesting enough calcium out of your food. Which I've, 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 I go through because that's what the, the adult specialist told me. He said, because you take these protein pump inhibitors, um, which you know, they're pretty popular these days, especially mm. when you're over a certain age in terms of um, acid production, um, which can cause you, you know, reflux, et cetera. Um, they, apparently they uh, impair your ability because you don't produce enough acid mm -hmm. now because you're taking something to stop it from me. They impair your ability to die, uh, to actually get a, enough calcium out of your food and indeed enough vitamin B12 out of your food for that matter as well. And uh, and which sort of requires you then, well, then you're not getting enough calcium and you, you can get, like women, you can get sort of an osteoporosis sort of mm. situation for men as well. So what, 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 so in those situations, I mean, apart from taking a, a, something to supplement, um, it's what's important, I guess, is to make sure you do do proper, ha really do ha op try and optimize your strength program, mm -hmm. and also impact exercises. So what's boxing, that mean? boxing, or skipping. Yep. These types of like hitting the ground, right? Higher impact that running? plus resistance training, running. Yep. If you can run. Yep. These these are also good modalities to throw in, and this we we kind of didn't talk about this at the beginning, but personalization. So like when when I'm working with someone or educating, we have key predictors that we would measure. And some of these are laboratory tests. So looking at 
ApoB or cholesterol or blood sugar control. Some of these are tests like doing a DEXA scan and looking at bone mineral density. Well, can we talk about that for a sec? Yeah. Because it's funny, only this morning I sent my cousin, who's got a bit of weight on him, a place that does DEXA scans and you know, boxes do this all the time. But before we go off to lose weight, we want to know how much fat we've got, where the fat is and have, have we got enough fat to lose relative to our, our, our mass and to make sure we fight, we are, because our body's changed, are, mm-hmm. are we fighting in the right division? And uh, and then we do a metabolic rate test, which is, you know, yep. as you know, you know, you work out what your calorie usage is at rest. I did one recently in Boston. Yeah. So, and, and, and I sent that to my cousin. I said, dude, before you go on some diet and do some training environment, Learn a little bit about your body first. I mean, have you got subcutaneous fat or you got visceral fat? I mean, is the fat hanging out all over your liver and your heart or where is it? Like what's going on? And uh, he's never heard of it. I couldn't believe it. And he's uh, like he, he runs a very successful business and um, and you just you just hit it on. I mean, how important is it to be in these these environments to get baselines and to be scientific? It's critical. If you want to have intent, so you mentioned nutrition, there's exercise, sleep, these key pillars, in order to know where you need to really focus your attention on, are you someone that really needs to focus on zone two training? Or are you someone that really needs to focus on resistance training? Or both. Both, right. And and there are there is a template, right, for everyone that most of us should be doing. But then based on what we see when we measure things, we can focus on little parts somewhat more. And then more importantly, after you intervene with intention, you can remeasure. And you can have a strategy. You can have because so, you, you've got to have a strategy, analyst. I mean, it's not just oh shit. Oh, I might do the Mediterranean diet, which is sort of what we do, isn't it? Like, or oh, I'm, I'm going to listen to the proof. I'm going to go and listen to you speak, and I walk away. And but I don't have a strategy. You know, the strategy is well, what's my starting point? I mean, yeah. and they're not that expensive. I mean, the the Dexas and uh, metabolic rate tests. I think you can get it like for 160 bucks. They give you both for that, and then they give you a repeat. You can go back and redo it in six months' time to see where you're at. Because like knowing how where your fat is distributed, I think mo- a lot of people don't appreciate that the importance of fat distribution. Yeah, and maybe you haven't even heard of visceral or ectopic fat before. And well, they're the bad ones. They're the bad ones. So so you know our Ability to store fat subcutaneously is very much determined by our genes. Yeah. And there's a researcher in the UK, Roy Taylor. He, his research really elucidated all of this. And he came up with what is now known as the personal fat threshold. So if genetically, if you have sort of won the genetic lottery and you have a, a really good capacity to store fat subcutaneously, which means under the skin, yeah, like around your belly. Right. So you can you can get away with a little bit more weight gain before it starts to hurt you from a cardiometabolic point of view. So before you start to go to the doctor and they say, hey, your blood sugar is not good, your triglycerides look bad, um, before you get pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, this is why you can have two people standing in front of you. They are the same body fatness, but one of them has type 2 diabetes and the other doesn't. That person who has developed type 2 diabetes has a lower personal fat threshold. They are not as capable of storing fat subcutaneously in the skin. So we have to store it somewhere. Where does that energy go? It spills over and starts getting inside, which is ectopic fat. Around organs. Inside the organs, mainly the liver and the pancreas, but also muscle tissue. And then in between the organs, which is visceral fat. And this is the very damaging fat. It causes insulin resistance we see increased essentially we see energy toxicity we start getting energy being stored where it shouldn't be so we're getting fat deposits in the liver in the pancreas we get what's called insulin resistance essentially it gets harder to get glucose into our cells our cells use glucose to um, take the energy in our food carbohydrates and turn that into an energy ATP that the body can actually utilize. And you'll see your, you know, as I said, the way that will show up is blood glucose levels will become elevated. Triglycerides will become elevated. ApoB, which is a a very potent um, predictor of cardiovascular disease, will become elevated. And all of these things are are sort of coalescing to increase your risk of of having a heart attack, having a stroke, developing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, so certainly understanding 
where your personal fat threshold is important. And one way of, of doing that other than doing a basic lab test and seeing if blood glucose is in range and triglycerides is a DEXA scan because the DEXA scan will tell you how much visceral fat you have. You're saying baselines are good if you can afford it because not everyone can afford it, of course, but like uh, getting a baseline is important and, and knowing about your, your body And because, by the way, these are things that spur you on to go, shit, like I've got that problem. Um, and, and by the way, uh, uh, you know, I've got fatty fat in between muscles or fat in between organs or fat in organs. Um, I better do something about that. That's one. Two, the metabolic rate test tells you because you, you got to get a bit mathematical about these things, you know. Oh, how many calories? Today I only had a 1,000 calories. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Uh, that's so stupid because uh, if you don't do anything, uh, a metabolic rate test might will tell you that just to f- sit there in one spot mm. for 24 hours, breathe, digest, think, <laughs> you need you might need 1,900 calories, whatever. That's that's what mm. I need, 900 cal- 1,900 calories um, because I, I've had the t- test on a few times. So... But then, well, I, I don't want to be put in a position where my calorie deficit is so bad that I can't even actually function properly and then I become dull or I become um, – I don't, I don't become as responsive because my body's going, well, shit, what's going on here, Mark? You know, like it's one thing to deny myself or go on a calorie deficit over and above what I need to, at rest. So a metabolic rate test, rate test you would say is a good idea to give yourself a base on. But what about bloods? Because you, you you mentioned APOB, like um, mm. I've never seen a doctor yet prescribe it. Mm. You go to the doctor and say, I can never give me a, what do they call it, a blood test? A, It'll have LDL cholesterol, or total cholesterol. But they won't do the APO. The, the, I've never seen that come out in a blood test, mm. APOB. That's li, uh, lipoprotein B. Apolipoprotein B. B. Yeah. So why don't, why don't we, I mean, all these guys who, you know, these guys overseas who have these podcasts that keep talking about it has one of the big predictors. You just said it's one of the big predictors of um potential. It's required. If you're going to have fatty plaque building up in your artery that ends up affecting blood flow to the heart yep. or to the brain, which yep. can cause a heart attack or a stroke, then that elevation in ApoB is a necessary component. It's a precursor. It's not the only thing that's going to contribute to that yep. pathology, but – it's the initial spark that's required. So it's definitely a precursor. It's, it's a condition precedent for it to happen. Let's One of the say conditions precedent. If you're lucky and you're born and genetically you have super low ApoB, you will not develop heart disease. Yeah. So can I ask you this? And I mean, I, I know you're not giving medical advice, but I mean, if I let's say I'm 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 a I'm, I'm lucky enough to be blessed not to have to have to have super low ApoB, um, which is a uh, which is basically yeah, anyway, it's a lipid. So it's a fatty protein that floats around your system. The simple way for people to understand what ApoB is yeah. without going into detail, I did seven hours of podcast on this right. with a lipidologist, Dr. Thomas Dayspring. So without us going into crazy amounts of detail, yeah. most people have heard of LDL, LDL yeah. cholesterol. Yep. Okay, Which is and, a crappy one. And LDL cholesterol is a crappy one. This, you know, As the story goes, that causes this fatty plaque to build up in the artery wall. The simple story is that it's not just LDL. There is IDL and V. Um, LDL. So there's different types of these lipoproteins that are called atherogenic, which means that they have the potential to crash into the artery wall and build up. When we measure ApoB, it summates them. So it adds up LDL plus IDL plus VLDL. So it just gives us a better overall understanding of the concentration of these compounds in your blood, which are there for a reason. They're there to help you transport fats and cholesterol because they're not water soluble. So they need to be carried by a protein. And that's what ApoB is. This test just adds them all up and says, what's the total uh, amount of concentration of these potentially problematic lipoproteins in, in Mark's blood at the, at the moment? And based on that, we know what your risk is of developing atherosclerosis. Just before I, I said, if you have genetically low, you won't get heart disease. I just want to caveat that. You won't get atherosclerotic heart yeah, disease. You're still going to get heart disease. Which you can get different types of heart yeah, disease. Yes, so the valve might drop. But the most common type is atherosclerotic yeah. heart disease and you won't get that type. So so when I go, so I might I might go off and get a, um, a DEXA scan. I might go off and get a, a metabolic rate test. I might to get my base on. I might go then to my doctor and say, look, I'd like to get a full blood test. Mm-hmm. Um, is there something I should be asking the doctor to do in that blood test? I mean, is there say, look, hey, doctor, do you mind including 
this and is, is it cost me more money or I mean because obviously the doctor has a standard blood test he sends you to one of those pathology companies and there's a standard and it's probably covered by Medicare or whatever however it works it, do I have to is there something I should be asking my doctor in addition to the standard stuff I have a one page like resource yep that I can give you for the show notes yeah, yeah. that makes that process super easy and, and if I go to your website if, if yeah, so it's accessible on, on the proof.com. You can go there and there's a blood test guide. Yep. It's one or two pages long and it just outlines what, what are some of these tests that you should ask for. And you might get a little bit of pushback. Yeah. And that's because, you know, physicians are not used to being told what to order from their patient. And what I would say to that is, A, I think ideally you have a physician that is open to listening to you. You need to be an advocate for your own health. So 100%. Hopefully you have a relationship Take control. with your doctor where they actually want you to be involved in your in your health. Yep. Um, if you don't, then maybe try and find an, another physician that is going to work with you in that capacity. There are also some online services. I have no affiliation with these, but there is one called iScreen in Australia that I've yep. used myself. It's a little bit more expensive. Yeah, it is more expensive. Right. So ideally you can go to your doctor and order some of these tests and they might have a little bit of a cost, but I think APOB might cost $10. Yeah. So it's not crazily expensive for most people. Extra $10. An extra $10. Yeah. Um, it's not something covered by Medicare. No. Yeah, because they're – Not currently, but there are people pushing. Yeah, so there should be. For that to be updated. So – Get so the, go to your get website. The, get, get the PDF yep, yep. and that will give you the information you need to have the discussion right. as a starting point. So, there, the, so I've got some measurements, some baselines, and I now know and I've got my blood baselines. Mm -hmm. And so this should give me some indications of what I, my problems might be or right. where I need to be careful. And what you need to focus on. What I need to be focused on. So then, and we've talked about resistance training just generally. It's, um, you know, there's all sorts of ways to achieve or optimize your, your resistance training. I talked about the three five system, but basically you got to get the muscle groups and exercise them properly yeah. to, to, to until you get to a point where you can't exercise, you can't lift it more, you can't do two more. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. There's twelve. If we want to keep it super simple, so that what we spoke about is how far to take a set. Yep. So let's let's keep it super simple and say we're going we're going to work within six to twelve reps. We're going to choose a weight so that at the end of that set we feel like we really only had two reps left. We were that close to failure. If you're an advanced lifter, you might go to failure sometimes. And yep. There is some research to show benefit there. Let's push that to the side. Now the question is how many sets over a week do you need to do for that given body group? Yep. So if we're talking about chest, or we're talking about back, yep. or we're talking about um, quads, Legs. or we're talking about hamstrings and glutes. And the research is pretty clear on that. You want a minimum of 10 sets per week Effective sets, effective sets being what I just described, choosing that weight, getting within two reps per of muscle failure, group. per muscle group. Right. And so it really depends on how many times someone's getting into the gym. If someone's only getting in twice a week, then a full body workout in each session is going to probably be the best strategy. If they are getting in three times a week, you might have a dedicated leg session a sort of push session and a pull session. So some of this is has to be customized based on the number of training sessions that someone can do. But over the week, the volume is important across the week. It doesn't matter so much in one session. So try over the week to get to those 10 sets as a minimum for that that given body. So group. You just so I understand this, does that mean that unless I'm doing chest today, I'm only doing chest today, three different chest exercises three times so you're in nine session. sets yeah. you're almost at that minimum so i just need to do one more set yeah that's enough for the week and that's the minimum effective volume yep. you probably still continue to get benefits up to 20 sets a week yep. and as you get more and more experienced the more sets you have to do to yeah, get, yeah. to drive the adaptation yeah, so the body because the body gets used to it so that now that's my my resistance work okay so but obviously it doesn't help my heart and lungs no and you talked about zone two um, maybe you can explain what zone two is in terms of, yeah, what, 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 uh, for me it would be running, okay, but I'm not a cyclist um, and I definitely couldn't do zone two on a rower <laughs> and I couldn't do zone two on a erg machine So, and I don't like swimming. Um, I don't want to jump in the pool. So let's say what first explain what is zone two and what, is, what would it look like, for example, if I was running. Mm. Okay, so now we're talking about cardiovascular training. 
So we're talking about driving adaptations within the cardiovascular system. So centrally, to have a healthier heart that's mm. that's pumping more efficiently. We're talking about skeletal muscle and the peripheral vasculature being healthier. And we're talking about increasing what, what is described as our cardiorespiratory fitness, which if you were to test, and this is something we haven't spoken about, but a test for that would be VO2 max. Yeah, well, can we just come back to VO2 max in yeah. a sec? Yeah, we can we, come back to it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, zone 2 training is a particular type of cardiovascular training at what we would describe as a moderate intensity, okay? 60 to 70% of your maximum heart rate would be how it's defined in the literature. My heart rate. So let's say I'm 60, let's say. Um, so it's 120 minus 60, 140. 220 60, minus your age. So, so 220 minus 60, so it's uh, uh, 160. Mm-hmm. So would you say 60 to 80% of that? 60 to 70%. Okay, let's pick 70. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, seven times, that's seven and 36, so it's 110 for argument's mm-hmm. sake. So you, you want me to be have my heart rate at 110? So you can calculate it at 60% and 70% and then you have your range, right? Now, I just did a, a three-hour podcast on this with Inigo San Milan, who's the, the, the world-leading scientist in this space. And we kind of settled on the fact that all of these heart rate calculations – are probably a little bit of overkill. Right. And he's testing people in the lab and, and looking at what's happening metabolically and comparing that to their heart rates and he sees a lot of variability. Yeah, yeah. So what seems to be the best strategy and also most accessible is the talk test. Okay, so I, I know I've done this. So you, you, you can't really talk whilst you're doing it. You've got to be ru- going at a running at a rate that I'm probably puffing a little bit, just a little bit so I can't have, I can't have a conversation you, with it. That's zone three. That's zone three, is so it? So okay. zone two, I can. You can have a conversation with me. So, is, but is I'm going like to say, this? Mark, are you are you exercising right now? Like, if we're on the phone and I can't yeah. see you, I'm going to say, Mark, are you on the bike right now? And you're going to say yes, and I'm not going to say call me back later because it's not interruptive enough. You're a little bit puffy, but you can still hold the combo, right. so we can still have our meeting. Right, and that's okay. a really good. Um, indicator for someone to know that they're not in zone one or zone three. So, so as opposed to getting sort of caught out and saying, I've got to do 110 uh, uh, heartbeats a minute. Yes. Because somebody might be fitter at my age than someone else and 110 for someone else might be pretty tough. But 110 <laughs> maybe for, you know, you might be, uh, if you're assuming you're the same age as me, might be mm-hmm. too easy. Because it can't be too easy too, can it? Your, your, your heart rate range, if you were going down the path of calculating what your target heart rate is for zone two is going to be highly individual. And unless you're a performance athlete and then you go into a lab and you do lactate testing and you get very specific, I mean, we've got to remember 70% of adults in this country are just not even moving their body. Yeah. So we want to make this super accessible, right? Find that intensity where you're breaking sweat. If you're not breaking sweat and you're not a little bit puffy, then you're probably in zone one. Right. We want to get you up out of zone one into zone two. And why zone two? So why, why what, what is zone two preparing it me for? It stresses the mitochondria. Right, which is the energy sources in your muscles. So right. it's the power factories in the muscle that take glucose and fat along with oxygen and turn that chemical energy into ATP. We spoke about that before. ATP is just a fancy way of saying the body's own energy currency that it can then use. And it can use it for, a, you know, in a variety of ways in the body, but one that people will, um, that will make sense for people is using that ATP to move the skeleton. So we take that chemical energy and turn it into mechanical energy to pick up something yep. off the table. Um, Mitochondrial function is a hallmark of aging. So Inigo Samalan, his studies, he's taken people that have metabolic disease and then taken average adults without metabolic disease. We should come back to that though. That's interesting. And then elite athletes. And he's, he's been able to very clearly show that mitochondrial dysfunction is occurring in these people with metabolic disease their mitochondria are much less efficient at utilizing these energy substrates and they have a much poorer ability to clear lactate. A lot of people have heard of lactic acid or lactate. In the muscles. Yeah. And it's kind of been painted as the bad guy 
it's not necessarily the the bad guy. There's been a lot more research on this over the years. But uh, what comes along for the ride with lactate is these hydrogen ions. And long story short, they cause the pH in the cell to drop. And that's what is partly contributing to loss of power and fatigue. So when you look at someone with metabolic syndrome at a much lower sort of, uh, not lower intensity, let's say at a relative intensity, they might walk up a flight of stairs and feel puffed and fatigued. Their mitochondria are dysfunctional and they, they're getting built up of lactate and hydrogen ions doing a very, very, what we would consider a low intensity exercise as opposed to an elite athlete is getting into that same position, pumping out, you know, three, 400 watts on a, on a bicycle. And how long should I be doing this for zone two? Like, yeah. is it, we talking about 20 minutes? So zone two training is the stimulus that's going to cause those mitochondria to upgrade. Right. Stimulates them. Stimulates them. It's, it's, it's essentially stressing them and the body responds to that stress by becoming more resilient, becoming more efficient. And the zone two will also result in what's called mitophagy which is clearing out of, you know, dysfunctional mitochondria, making room for new mitochondria. So we can actually build new mitochondria. And Inigo spoke about this where he looked at 60-year-olds, right? And, you you know, you just said you're 60, so this is Older. perfect. He looked at 60-year-olds who started increasing their exercise output, particularly zone two, and they were able to, from a metabolic health point of view, they were able to get their mitochondria functioning as if they were 30, right? So th- that's a promising story because it means that it's not too late to start this. If you've you know, had a, a sedentary lifestyle, you've been super busy with work and you haven't been doing this, the body is very resilient and it will still upgrade later in life if you get started. But, to answer uh, your question, yeah. how much you need to do. Yeah, like per session. 30 minutes minimum on a session. Yep. And ideally that's continuous. So you're not going out of zone two into zone yeah. one and zone three. You're trying to sit in that zone two yep. for 30 minutes consecutively. You can go longer than that. And then across a week, the the guidelines will say 150 minutes a week. Yeah, and oh, I've seen the 120, 150 minutes. Yeah. Right, and 150 minutes a week has been shown in some, some studies compared to someone who does nothing will half your risk of total mortality, which means death from any cause. So there's huge benefits off of grabs if you can get to 150. But Inigo really, you know, underscored the point that if you want optimal mitochondrial function, then you want to get to about 300 minutes a, a of week. zone two per week. Yeah. So we, we're talking about like 10, 30-minute sessions or, you know. Five, one-hour sessions. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot it's of volume. Lot. And I, I'm not sure that's realistic for the general public. I think the message needs to be that anything is better than nothing. And people need to work within the, the context of what their schedule looks like. But I, I do think we have to, you know, a lot of what I say to people is probably not what they want to hear, but it's what they need to hear. You know, it's easy to gravitate towards the simple fix. Can I just take an NAD supplement? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and we can fool ourselves into thinking that's going to be the solution. That's going to help us prevent the suffering that we want, we want to avoid. But Unfortunately, it's not. And the great thing about science and why I love it is that uh, this is a perfect example. We don't have to throw darts with the lights off. Yeah. The science is turning the lights on. We have this this beautiful science here looking at zone two training. We just have to find a way to do it. We've talked about diets. We've got, we've also got a bit of a handle on that. Um, we're going to have to park sleep today. Um, but Clearly, you've got to have a good sleep strategy anyway. Um, we've talked about resistance training. We've, tra- we've talked about baselines, resistance training. We've talked about zone two, which is sort of underpins heart, lung health, let's call it that, your skeletal health as well, and it also underpins your vascular health. But the final one, and the thing, that, the killer, the, the tough one, I find it's the toughest one to, to do every week is VO2 max. Mm. What is VO2 max and how do you test for your VO2 max and then how often should you practice your VO2 max and what does that mean? It's the it, maximum amount of oxygen that you can utilize at high intensity exercise per minute per kilogram of body weight. Yep. <laughs> and essentially it just tells us how 
what your cardio respiratory fitness status is. Mm. Now, zone two training will affect your VO2 max, right? It's not just that you have to get into this very high intensity exercise. And, and you know, in speaking to a lot of people um, in this field, for years, the studies have stacked high intensity exercise up against zone two, what's superior. And there's almost no studies have looked at combining the two together, which is arguably from what we understand is going to be the best approach here. For so most uh, how do I, how would I put it together? How would so I put my VA 80% max? of your time in zone two. If you, if you yep. say, okay, I'm doing cardiovascular training over a week. I'm going to do 150 minutes. I'm going to, uh, I'm going right. to do that. Yeah. So if you're doing 150 minutes, you know, roughly this isn't going to be exact. I don't have a calculator here, but let's, let's say you're doing 150 minutes of zone two and 20, 25, 25 to 30 minutes yeah, of, yeah. of high intensity. So that means training. What does it mean though? 85 to 95% of your maximum. But I could rate. run for 25 minutes at 85 or 90% of my max. So I, I just couldn't run for that right, long. So, so we break it down into intervals. And, and how much rest should I have? So this is work time. Um, you know, again, the science in the studies is, is often using what's called a four by four protocol. Yeah. So four minute rest, four minute race. So we go hard for four minutes, four minutes. Now off. in practice, I find a lot of people find it very difficult to sustain a four minute I, I can't. interval at 85 to 95% I, of I can't. heart rate. I, I can't. So what I would say to people is across your week, I, I ideally want say 10 to 20% of your overall cardiovascular time to be in zone four or five. Which is eighty-five to ninety-five percent. That's, that's VO two max, right? Yeah, of your yeah, yeah. max yeah. heart rate, right? But we can break that down and say, okay, if that's you know twenty minutes across a week, then it might be that you're doing one minute efforts, and you're going to have twenty of those one minute efforts across a week. But in one session, or no, no, you can do you can spread four it a day. Out. You can spread it out five days. And okay. one of the I think because to do zone four or five, you need to be warmed up. Yeah, so yeah. the way that I personally do that yep. is I do it at the back end of the zone two training. Right, okay. So you do your 45 minutes or 50 minutes on the zone two, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you can still have a conversation, whatever it is you're doing. You might be on the bike or row or running, whatever it is. And then at the end of it, you say, I might just slip in a couple of one-minute sprints here. Right, and I'll do that if I'm doing zone two on a stationary bike. Yep. I'll do those efforts on a stationary bike. Or often I'll jump over just to change th – things up and do it on a rowing machine, yeah. which I find is a really great way to get your heart rate. That is a killer. Right up. Yeah. Um, and I guess just to, to to add something to this story, I mentioned lactate before and elite athletes are really good at clearing lactate. It's not that they don't produce it. They're just great at clearing it. And lactate can actually be shuttled back into the mitochondria. It can be used as an energy substrate. When you're doing zone two training, we are mostly using – the type one muscle fibers, which are slow twitch. And slow twitch means slow to fatigue. They can kind of just work all day. And that's where most of the mitochondria are. When we go and do this zone four or five, now this is high intensity. We start recruiting type two muscle fibers, fast twitch, fast to fatigue. And that's where most of the lactate's actually produced. When we are doing zone two training, we get those type one muscle fibers better at receiving lactate. And when we do zone five training, we get those type two muscle fibers better at letting go of lactate. So the two work together to create better lactate clearance. This is why all endurance athletes, they don't neglect one of these. They, they tend to spend 80% of their time in zone two and 10 or 20% of their time. Zone two for them, by the way. Yeah, Which zone two is, for them. But zone two for everyone is a relative. So, yeah, 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 so yeah. their zone two, they're able to talk and be puffy, just, but they're just doing far more watts on the yeah, bike. Yeah, yeah, they're going. Their output is much higher. Well, for me, it would be like sprinting. Right. Uh, uh, to exactly. To be the equivalent. So their zone two could be, you know, our zone four. four. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the good thing about this, though, Simon, is that over time, you your zone two will change. Because it will. You, so, But you'll still – be able to talk and yeah, you'll no, still be sweaty. Yeah, yeah. But you'll be either in that duration, you'll be doing more kilometers or you'll be pedaling out a greater number of watts. Yeah, you might be going from nine kilometers per hour on the machine if you're running on a machine to say 12 kilometers. Mm -hmm. But that's your goal. Hopefully one day you can do 12 kilometers, still have a conversation. Yeah. That's and, a big call, but yeah. And if you want to, to, to come back to your earlier point about the importance of testing something, if you want to test and then intervene here and then retest, so you can go to a lab and, and do a VO2 max. That's that can cost a little bit of money. So it yeah. might not be accessible to everyone. 
I don't know if you remember it, but did you ever do a shuttle test or a beep test back, yeah, back at school? Yeah, beep test, yeah. Okay, so there's a beautiful study that's been done looking at how well does a beep test or shuttle test correlate with VO2 max done in the laboratory? And it correlates incredibly well. Enough to, to say that for most people, if you're not wanting just to go and splurge on the VO2 max test in a lab, you can do a beep test. And I've put this into a table as well, so I can I can share that with you. Where you go, you you do the beep test, you'll end up with a score. It could be seven four or eight two or ten whatever. And on the chart, male and female is a different chart that corresponds to a given VO two max. And from that, you can see is your cardio respiratory fitness is it low? Is it below average, average, above average, or elite? Does that show, do you, if, I, if 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 people who listen to this go to your website and they go into VO two max, it, does your will your table tell us if I have a certain read of my VO two max? I say it's thirty five for argument's sake. Will that tell me where I rank? It'll Is tell it, you what category you fall into. Category, okay, that's yeah. great. Because, and then you can also just go away and. In, implement some of this stuff we're talking about and try and improve and retest yeah down the track yeah which is what this is all about i mean i think what this is all about we're not trying to create elite athletes here um well i guess you could try to but like we're not trying we're trying to create um elite health band in other words help us your what you're trying to create is help people like me improve and, and get to an optimum position where i'm comfortable you know it's not about mark you've got to be so committed you've got to do 200 Minutes a week, and uh, but it's not supposed. This is not supposed to be punishing. It's supposed to be uh, sort of enjoyable, right? And have a good goal, and and so when we get our food right, and when we get our exercise right, and when we get our community right, what's the goal here? What we're really, what am I? And I just want to finish off on this. I mean, why would I do all these things instead of as opposed to just oh, stuff it? I just go down the pub, have a few beers, eat a bag of chips, watch the footy. Eat a pie. I couldn't be stuffed doing this hundred minutes a week. Like, uh, what, yeah. what? What am I trying to do here? What? What's the ultimate benefit to me? I think sometimes we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're invincible, and that we're not going to follow in the footsteps of everyone around us. Yeah. But if you look around and you look at the state of health, you know, how can we expect different results if we're doing the exact same things? Well, that old saying, you know, that's a definition of stupidity. Right. Um, so I think this is just about taking control of our health and ownership and, and really understanding that if we the, – the more intent that we have, then the greater return on investment we get for our time. So often I get people coming to me and saying, I, I don't like going to the gym because I don't know what to do. and I'm, I'm intimidated. And they're spending so much of their week in there. Yeah. And so one of my things is, well, I want to educate you so you can actually spend less time in there but get greater return. Yeah. And when you are intentionally lifting weights, you're intentionally doing cardiovascular training, which means acquiring a little bit of knowledge to get started, then you're going to get much more out of it. You're actually going to feel better in your day-to-day -day as well. This is not just about long-term. We haven't spoken too much about that, but it's almost counterintuitive from an energy point of view you're using energy when you exercise, but it's actually giving you energy. <laughs> you will feel more energized in your um, your, your day to day. So, okay, and can I ask you this, Simon, if you don't mind? I, I presume um, this what we just discussed is not just about men; it's about men and women. Yeah, it's, it's so resistance training. The whole thing is equivalent for women as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So, the, so you know, because you know, the general view is women go and do Pilates and uh, yoga, and men do, go to the gym and lift weights. But you're saying that the, these, this, the science around this is an equivalency. So there's no, there's no uh, gender bias either way. There's no gender bias from a, a broad, big picture point of view here. Yep. And. You know, with, I'm talking about a template here yep. with having some resistance yeah, yeah. training and cardiovascular training that's training different zones. But I think yoga and Pilates have their role. Yeah. And they'll have their role more so for certain individuals, say, for example, that have stability problems or they're recovering from certain injuries. And, you know, I do yoga myself. So I'm not saying these are the only things that yeah. we can do. But they have um, sp specific outcomes as opposed to the general outcomes. Right. And I think to to kind of round this out a little bit, it's not about being perfect with this stuff. You, rather than, you know, often we want to do something for six weeks, the new diet yep. or the new exercise plan, and we go all in and we try and just do it perfectly, but we run out of steam by the end of it. And then we go back to whatever lifestyle we were leading before that, which has a whole lot of unhealthy behaviors. 
So people need to understand that you don't have to do this perfectly. I, I would much rather over decades you do it imperfectly but consistently yeah. with the nutrition, with the exercise, with the sleep, with the relationships. And that lifetime exposure is going to be really what matters, not what you kind of buy into over a six-week challenge. Yeah, because, you know, we don't do this just before the Melbourne Cup and Melbourne Cup comes in the, <laughs> the beginning of the and we just fuck ourselves completely <laughs> for the next three months. Hey, I, no, I get it. And I, Simon, I really I, – I found this sort of quite fascinating but it's also good, to be frank with you, to hear an Aussie talk about it mm -hmm. because, you know, most of us are sort of pretty much um, become addicted to what's – who's – telling us about over, about these things overseas and we tend to have this view that oh, everyone from overseas has a better view on the world than we have when in fact your podcast, The Proof, and obviously your website, um, you, Simon, you get guests in, world-leading guests, and you talk about exactly the same stuff that, as, as these more globally famous people talk about um, and it's right here in Australia and it's relevant to all of us. And uh, so I appreciate that. Simon Hill from uh, The Proof Podcast and theproof.com, not yes. .com, or you, .com. .com. Yeah. Uh, get there. Uh, from my point of view, I'm going to be going there. I'm going to listen to what you've got to say and you're now on my podcast list, mate. Mark, thank you very much for having me. I really it's enjoyed it. It's been an honour. Cheers.